Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeff Resnick. I'm chief of the History of Medicine Division here at the U.S. National Library of Medicine of the National Institutes of Health. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here in NLM's Lister Hill Auditorium and all of you watching remotely via our global live feed uh, to our History of Medicine lecture series. Uh, this lecture series of the NLM's History of Medicine Division promotes awareness and use of NLM and other historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the National Library of Medicine to recognizing and celebrating diversity. All of our lectures are free and open to the public, and as I mentioned, all of our lectures are also live streamed and archived by NIH video casting, a public service made possible through a generous gift to the National Library of Medicine from the Michael E. DeBakey Medical Foundation, and we're very grateful, of course. Um, before I introduce, uh, uh, before I uh, introduce my colleague, who will be introducing our guest speaker, I'd like to take a moment to let you know about our next uh, History of Medicine lecture, which will be on May 25th at 2 p.m. here in the Lister Hill Auditorium, which will be the second annual NLM Michael E. DeBakey Lecture in the History of Medicine. Our speaker will be Heidi Moorfield, uh, candidate, uh, PhD candidate in the History of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Ms. Moorfield was, in 2017, one of our uh, Michael E. DeBakey uh, Fellows in the History of Medicine. The topic of her presentation will be Transplanting Technology, Dr. Michael DeBakey and Cold War Technology Transfer. So please join us here on May 25th for this exciting lecture by Ms. Moorfield, and it will also be broadcast online. And both that lecture and today's lecture will be archived and made available uh, through that archive uh, for anyone who would like to watch at a later date. It's my, now my pleasure and privilege to introduce my colleague, Christy Moffitt, who is really ideally suited to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Trevor Owens from the Library of Congress. Christy is chair of NLM's Web Collecting and Archiving Working Group and manager of the Digital Manuscripts Program in the History of Medicine Division here at NLM. Her scope of work, really her experience and expertise, align very closely and importantly with Dr. Owens and what he will be sharing in his lecture with us today. So please join me in welcoming Christy and certainly in cooperation with her, thanking Dr. Owens for his time with us today. We're thrilled to have him. Christy. Thank you, Jeff. Um, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Trevor Owens is a librarian, researcher, policymaker, and educator working on digital infrastructure for libraries. Dr. Owens serves as the first head of digital content management for library services at the Library of Congress. He teaches graduate seminars in digital history for American University's History Department and graduate seminars in digital preservation for the University of Maryland's College of Information, where he's also a research affiliate with the Digital Curation Innovation Center. Owens has previously worked as a senior program administrator at the United States Institute of Museum and Library Services, and before then at the Library of Congress on digital preservation strategy and as a history of science curator. Um, it was during this earlier time at LC when I had the pleasure of working with Owens um, in a meeting he organized titled uh, Science at Risk Toward a National Strategy for Preserving Online Science, which brought in multiple stakeholders together to discuss the, future, discuss the value and future uses of online scientific discourse and how libraries, archives, and museums might uh, work together to support long-term access. This meeting inspired some of the web collecting work we've done, undertaken here at NLM and has also reinforced the value and opportunity for preserving a wide range of perspectives in science and medicine. Dr. Owens is the author of three books, the most recent of which, uh, The Th Theory and Craft of Digital Preservation, is in press with Johns Hopkins University Press. Just last month, Library Journal identified Owens as a 2018 mover and shaker for his ability to see the big picture and think strategically about digital materials and the policies surrounding them. So welcome, and many thanks to Dr. Owens for coming to the National Library of Medicine to discuss and share his thoughts on scientists' hard drives, databases, and blogs, preservation intent, and source criticism in the digital history of science, technology, and medicine. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I'll point these up a little bit. Um, I'm at the, I'm generally at like the like max out height on all kinds of presentation technologies. Um, I'm thrilled to be here first off. Uh, I'm a huge fan, uh, long time huge fan of both NLM and specifically the history of medicine division. Um, and I think that'll probably come through as I talk up a few examples of really great work that has happened here. Um, and that I think is part of a very huge conceptual shift that, that we're working through right now about what, um, what it means to be a digital library, what it means to work uh, in archives with digital materials. Um, and so I'll start out also by thanking my uh, colleague, Carlin Osborne, who's here. So I'm waving at Carlin. Uh, we work together on this talk. We both have backgrounds in the history of science. I have a, a bachelor's degree in uh, history of science from the University of Wisconsin and Carlin from uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and then we both have backgrounds in library and information science too. So this is sort of a blending of those and in large part a storytelling uh, situation about thinking about what collections and objects mean uh, both as historians and researchers from that perspective and as uh, information science, librarians, archivists, uh, et cetera. So I'll start out by connecting a few things. Um, I often tell people that I work, when I tell people that I work on digital content management at the Library of Congress, which is a relatively recent thing, they, um, they say, oh, that's really great, that's so important, there's so much that needs to be digitized um, for working on it. And I say, no, I don't do digitization. It's, it is important and it's significant, but no, I work on digital preservation, long-term access to digital information, and then they go, huh? And then you say, well, it's really important, like, think about file formats, it becomes a whole conversation, we'll talk more about that as we go, but, um, then there's sort of some head scratching and like, yeah, that's probably important, but it's increasingly so much of our record is digital to begin with. Um, and so much of the nature of the way that, particularly relevant in this case, that science and medicine function is increasingly uh, digital. And so a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today comes from, uh, thank you for giving a mention to the, the forthcoming book. I will underscore that uh, you don't need to wait to get it or you don't need to buy it either. You can just read the preprint version of it. Um, I'm here at NLM, so I imagine I'm, a, I'm among fans of preprints. Um, uh, and so you can read a preprint of my book and I'll avoid hitting the microphone uh, going forward. But uh, this book reflects my attempts to sort of synthesize work on digital preservation, um, digital content management. And I think part of what is often misunderstood is that this digital thing is not new, we're actually pretty far into uh, an extensive set of changes that have resulted in uh, digital technology that's uh, you know, half a century old at this point. There's very old digital data um, that we're working with and that needs to be worked with. And that'll come through in some of my examples. But so for further reading on a lot of my points, you can go and read um, that, which is up in uh, an OSF preprint repository. And then the other paper that I'll, I'll be drawing from is sort of a different perspective on some of the same issues, which is what it means for the evidentiary basis of digital history to be shifting increasingly to digital archives and digital sources. Um, and the terms get used in a lot of different competing ways. Those are points that I get into a lot more in this paper, but if you want, um, you can get that there. I, I posted the slides online to my slide share so you can follow them along. There, I'll tweet them out again later. I'm TJ Owens on Twitter. But in any event, um, these are some further reading sources and context. The last set of experience that I'm drawing together in this talk is actually from my teaching experience. So I teach, as mentioned, I teach for American University and um, uh, the University of Maryland. And again, I have this sort of dual perspective in the, at the, at American University, I teach in the history department on digital history and at the University of Maryland as a information science uh, faculty member. And so in those cases, the, the, if you like, you can actually go and read up on what my students are doing in the digital history methods seminar that I'm teaching right now. It's dighist.org, but that sort of is another strand of reflecting on what this digital turn means for the future of the history of science, technology, and medicine. And so the talk today, I'm gonna work through uh, five objects, um, which I think is fun. I just inherit, it's always fun to talk about specific things that keeps us from being a very, uh, and there's a lot of talks that you can go to about the digital revolution that can say uh, fancy, uh, 
grandiose things, but very mundane and practical, and in some cases grand things, but that are very tangible, I feel like, is a much nicer jumping off point. So we're gonna talk about um, Carl Sagan's Word Perfect files. Um, I think maybe I should actually have the word, I don't remember if there's a space between Word Perfect or not in the actual name of it, but in any event, these are, these are his files. Uh, we're gonna talk about a floppy disk that was mailed to uh, mathematician and meteorologist Edward Lorenz. Um, we're going to talk about a web archive of scientists' blogs. Um, we're going to talk about a database of extragalactic distances, which just sounds delightful, right? How, what could be more significant than extragalactic distance? What could be more huge? Um, and then lastly, an application for accessing medical literature um, and data. And in each of these cases, you might say, why these five things, Trevor? And uh, I got three answers for you. One is, these are all things that have actually been collected by a cultural heritage or organization, a library archive or a museum. Um, they're each sources that can be, uh, they're each history of science, medicine, technology sources, so that's a, a theme that connects them all. And I've purposely tried to select a series of things that are very different from each other because I think they open up uh, some of the sort of significant questions that we're dealing with. But before I get to that, um, here's a little roadmap for the talk. So I'm going to work through some of uh, the assumptions that I think scholars and uh, librarians, archivists, curators bring to sources. Um, then I'm going to talk about the context collapse that is occurring around what sources are and what they will be in the future. And then I'm, throughout all the examples, I'll also be working at how these problems are being solved in the roles that need to be played both for scholars in the, in the current world and in the future, and for librarians, archivists, and, and curators. Um, so again, starting with going to the sources, I'll share my own early days experiences as a, a student doing my first original historical research. Um, when I started working on my undergraduate thesis, I spent a lot of time uh, talking to my advisor about sources, and I had kind of a unique experience at the University of Wisconsin in that there weren't a lot of undergrads studying the history of science. It just, it, there were maybe like five or six of us, I think, at any given time. It's a big university, but a small department. And sometimes they needed us around to justify keeping the sections open for the grad students. Um, so they'd let you sit in, because they had to get to eight students or something, right, to actually have a course run, um, which was amazing. It was great. I digress. Uh, I ended, so I ended up having a, a really great relationship with my thesis advisor um, and got a lot of attention from them because there just weren't that many of us around. And so we talk a lot about sources. I remember at one time trying to say, writing in something that this spoke for itself and then he crossed it out in this big way. And it's like, nothing speaks for itself. That's your job is to help interpret these things, to understand them, to give them context, to make sense of them. So I ended up working with, um, uh, I ended up working with books, but uh, most of my co colleagues were working with archives. And so I always loved, this is one of my favorite archives pictures. This is, uh, this is actually a manuscript collection that came into the Library of Congress before and after. Um, and so when people talk about original order or about how the, the material is not, uh, there's a lot of work that goes from getting those trash cans of things into becoming those boxes. But in any event, the, the default way for doing a lot of historical research was to find good archives and spend a lot of time coming to understand and see the world through the, the, the perspective and context that comes from that. And in this case, um, personal papers collections being a huge part of how that work happens. Um, uh, that's a, a great treasure that the Library of Congress are in, in these sorts of uh, Hollinger boxes lining the walls, and obviously the same is true here at the National Library of Medicine. Um, but I ended up working with published books, uh, my undergrad thesis ended up being about the history of children's books, about Marie Curie and Albert Einstein, um, which was a lot of fun. It, it started from this prompt where, interestingly, the most written about scientists for kids is Marie Curie. Second place by a long shot is uh, Albert Einstein. So I was looking through these children's books written for one purpose, but collected and maintained by libraries around the world. Um, uh, you know, for children, but the, the historical record of them exists and they became a really interesting source for looking at the history of storytelling around science and scientists. Um, and so I think at one point I had a new library loan, like 120 of these or something like that. Um, I had them from all over the world in any number of languages, uh, making use of the great infrastructure of libraries. 
Um, in this particular one, Marie Curie spends a lot of time hanging out with a test tube that talks, um, which is delightful. And uh, it's a value tale, so the value of learning comes through this story about Marie Curie. Um, happy to tell you more about it, but it's a story for another time. So in those examples there, at the beginning of my own experience with, uh, with collections, you can see some of the, the sort of parallels and tensions that have structured how we've come to work with materials in libraries, archives, and museums. That you've got these distinctions between published and unpublished, the published books being cataloged for one purpose, being distributed in a different way than the unpublished um, personal papers materials. Um, you have distinctions that exist in other cases that we'll delve into as well between textual works and artifactual ones. Um, uh, we organize our organizations often by formats, so the books are in one place, the journals another, magazines, archives, manuscripts, etc. And then the result of this is that there's a distinct set of professions and traditions that have emerged. Um, librarians have their ways, archivists theirs, folklorists their own, oral history, ethnography, all of these traditions that have their own particular points of view and ways of working with collections. And the, the thesis that, that I'll be working through in a lot of these examples is that this increasingly born digital world that we live in, these contexts have all largely collapsed so that we're increasingly in a space where we need to be thinking about what the best aspects of all those different traditions are, of the library tradition, of the archives tradition, um, and thinking about how those synthesize to work with materials that are uh, that break down many of those boundaries and barriers. So another way to say this is that when AV material came along, we made up AV archives, right? This is a, an AV archivists got their own set of traditions for how to do this work, and it was an adaptation. We we can't do that for digital um, in large part because it's it's literally hitting everything. So AV archivists now are actually digital archivists because they're working on digitizing this material or they're working with born digital video. There's every, functionally every format that we might work in uh, is, is increasingly mostly digital. Uh, the, the other caveat to that is that we still have to keep dealing with everything that we've always done. Uh, <laughs> none of that is going away. There's not gonna be a paperless office. Um, and instead what we're ending up with is this world where the digital is going to coexist in basically all the spaces that we've worked in to date. Um, and that'll come through in some of my uh, really exciting op objects, like Carl Sagan's Word Perfect Files. So this is what Carl Sagan's Word Perfect Files came in on. Um, astronomer Carl Sagan, uh, his papers were acquired by the Library of Congress Manuscript Division. And they contain some 379 floppy disks, much like this. Um, sometimes they have really important things written on the outside of them, so we do take photographs of them. Uh, but in the last decade, archivists have made some, some really huge advances in how to work with this kind of material. So you, get the, you want to get the data off the disks and then work with how to make the most sense of it. Um, and when you get something like this, like floppy disks in a personal papers collection. One of the questions becomes, how were these used? What do they mean? What can you do with them? And uh, there have been some really great examples that have come from other collections, and so I'll share one. Um, and then I'll come back to Carl Sagan's floppies uh, to try and make some sense out of what we do with these. What matters about these disks and about the, the uh, it's something on the order of 19,000 word perfect files on these floppy disks. Um, so I'm gonna talk about someone else's personal papers. And so this is uh, Jonathan Larson, the playwright who wrote Rent. Uh, the Library of Congress Music Division has his uh, personal papers. And in this case, um, this is actually uh, early Mac or an earlier Mac OS operating system running some of those files that were on those disks. And you can see some of the lyrics to one of the plays he was working in rendered in its original environment. Um, what happened with this that was really fascinating is the researcher who started working with it, Doug Reside, who's now a curator at New York Public Library, opened one of these files in a different tool than the original one that they had been intended for, and he found alternate lyrics to the, the play, right, or the musical, um, which is huge, right? In the world of, like, fines for a manuscript collection, the original or alternate lyrics is a big deal. Uh, he ended up then opening it in the, uh, the, the application it was meant to be opened in, um, the original one. And what ended up happening there was that the words were different. 
and it depended on which file, which piece of software you used to open it, that you got totally different lyrics. And the lyrics in the one that he would open, when he opened the right application when it was intended to be opened in, um, were the, the final lyrics. And it turned out that he played around with this a little bit, and the way that this version of Word worked was that um, quick saves were appended to the bottom of the file. They didn't overwrite the text. Um, they were it's just an operation for how to maximize the best use of your file storage um, and not be writing into the middle of the file. Um, and so it ended up keeping these, these traces of actually almost keystroke by keystroke changes in the text that were evident buried in the file um, in a way that wouldn't have been apparent if you had just rendered it. And so the, the point in this case is that when you're dealing with material like this where the files were really the handwritten work of the individual, it makes sense to spend a lot of time trying to think through how to get the most accurate rendering of those materials. Um, so when we came back to the Sagan material, it seems like, oh, you might think the innate thing to do with these is to try and get really high quality captures of the content on them, almost forensic traces of how they were used because it could have that kind of significance in them. But the interesting thing, and one of the challenges with this is that in working with the papers, it became very clear that Carl Sagan really wasn't much of a computer user. So why does he have 370 some floppy disks in there? And the reason why is intriguingly Carl Sagan dictated most of his work. He actually used a tape recorder and he would record himself. I'm gonna play one of these audio files just because it's pretty exciting. So this is a draft of, eh, just let me open it up quick. This is the, the original draft, functionally, of Contact, the novel, chapter three. Um, okay, this is a continuation of uh, Contact, uh, the next chapter, chapter three, I guess it is. For almost all of the tenure of humans on Earth, comma, the canopy of the stars was a constant companion. They soothed and comforted many, comma, in part because their extravagant display seemed to verify that the earth and the heavens were created for the benefit and delight of the human species. The stars um, uh, so you can, if you want, you can listen to 30 minutes of that on, online. And what's wild about that, again, is that he's, that's literally the first draft of the manuscript, right? Which is just, and he's sitting there saying comma, right? Like it's, um, it's like the grandeur of Carl Sagan, but in somewhat slow motion with punctuation marks. Um, but so what's on the floppy disks is actually the transcripts of all of those. So he would send out the, the cassettes, the transcripts would come back, and then he would annotate and mark up the transcripts. Um, and, I mean, first off, that's just really fascinating, right? That's an inherently interesting story, at least to me. And maybe it's not to you, but it's, here we are. I'm the one up here, so I get to claim it's interesting. Um, but what it ends up meaning is that you can't really, and this is something archivists have known for a long time, this is sort of a core archival principle, is that materials in archival collections make sense and hang together based on the ecology that emerges between the relationships of that material. So that um, the way someone maintained and organized their materials is itself information to be explored and understood. And so in this case, Another fascinating side note about this, that what, what it actually means is that the archive material, the paper in the archives, is largely um, printouts of the transcripts of the audio cassettes. Um, but then they annotated themselves, so they have this own, their own history. I think I've got a good example. So this is, um, uh, we have a whole draft of this up online if you're interested, but so this is a uh, table of contents to a full draft of Pale Blue Dot that we have up. If you see at the very top, uh, you may be able to make it out. It says 2A, 220, 1993. Um, but so the, the collection is full of these hand edits of full drafts of works. So, that, so then this went back into this cycle and became part of the process that ultimately resulted in the books. And the end result of this is that there's a really fascinating body of material to understand uh, 
uh, the history and development of uh, the, the Carl Sagan storytelling. Uh, but it's really only accessible through this complicated understanding this, the interrelations between these media. Um, and so at this point, someone could even say, do we, if there are, are copies of, uh, if the files are really just copies of things that we have in these other places, what's the significance of keeping them? And that gets to an interesting side note. This is an experimental um, interface to the collection material that um, I worked on with a colleague, Ed Summers, many years ago, uh, where we took the full text of the, those floppy disks, uh, all 19,000 files, and ran them through a topic modeling toolkit. So it actually tried to extract computationally what topical relationships were within the text, and then you could use this as an interface into the collection. And I think these are fun because, so topic modeling, if you're unfamiliar, is a, a way to um, identify uh, words that tend to co-occur and use that to organize documents. In this case, you've got things like um, uh, Carl Sagan, dear, doctor, cordially, Mr. Letter, Cornell University, uh, enclosed paper. Uh, this is like the bundle of words that tends to co-occur on much of his correspondence. And so that's actually a, a pretty useful point of entry into that. Um, and then you've got these other ones like uh, Earth, Mars, space, moon, um, it's interesting that these sort of bubble up from the documents. But what is intriguing about this and what I think is really significant for moving forward is that the, the digital files, all these floppy disks with these um, WordPerfect files end up becoming a really powerful index to the text of all the collection materials so that uh, you can in some ways use these files as a way to understand and approach um, the paper and the, the audio cassettes. So that's my initial Carl Stegen floppy disk story. I'll, I'll distill a couple of points that I think are relevant here, one of which is uh, there's, we can't really approach, we can't say what are the features of floppy disks in general that matter because what comes through this is that the features of disks and or files are very much tied up in the media ecology that they were produced for and in the intentional uses that you want to keep them for in the future, uh, which is a point that we'll repeat in a few other situations, and that even in cases where it seems like there may be redundant information that the text in these and the um, text in the, the printouts are, are similar, that there's different affordances that those media provide um, for indexicality, search, et cetera. So that's the, the Sagan floppies. Uh, my next story is about simulations that were mailed to Edward Lorenz. Um, so again, this is a personal papers collection. Uh, Lorenz was a, for those unfamiliar, was a leading mathematician and meteorologist. Uh, a lot of his work was essential to how we understand chaos and complexity, which I don't know about you, but I feel like I always need to understand more about chaos and complexity. It seems to be more and more a part of uh, what's essential about our world. And like the Sagan papers, they included um, floppy disks. So if you go online, you can actually find the finding aid for this. We have finding aid fans in the audience, hopefully. Yay. Um, so uh, if you look through the finding aid, you'll find some spaces where um, there's specific call outs to tangible media that were found in the collections. Here is one of those floppy disks. Um, and uh, here's, a, here's a picture where you, or an image of where you can find the, the, uh, the finding aid online at the Library of Congress. And inside one of those floppy disks is this. Um, and this is a still image. I, I had tried to embed a video, but you know how the like transferring and managing an embedded video was, was a challenge. So I'm just going to talk about what this thing would do if it was running. One of the letters in the Lorenz papers, um, there's actually a couple of them that included floppy disks. Uh, but this came with a simulation in it. <laughs> so it's... It, uh, it took a little work, and there was some tinkering around with this, but um, Amanda May, who works in preservation reformatting at the Library of Congress, was able to work with Kathleen O'Neill, the, uh, the archivist who's increasingly doing a lot of the sort of digital archives um, strategic work for the manuscript division. We're able to get this running, and you put in different inputs, and it runs, and it generates different simulation results. Um, and it's super fascinating and interesting. There's a couple different kinds of simulations that were sent to Lorentz over time. But... 
We've always had the possibility that someone could mail someone an enclosed thing. So enclosures and in letters have often included things like uh, a journal article or a draft or something like this, all kinds of different media. But what's crazy about a thing like this is this is almost more like a, it's, a, it's a, a complex digital work that's dependent on software. So to run this, you actually need to, we were able to boot it up in a uh, emulated version of an older um, uh, DOS operating system. But it requires, uh, it runs, which is another challenging thing. This is a complicated thing about software in general is that we're looking increasingly at the need to get material in any number of different kinds of collections that is, um, is not static but is dynamic and that um, in this case requires different inputs, result in different outputs uh, and change. So in this case, where you could imagine in the past having some sense of looking at an archive collection and saying that you've got a feel for it just by looking at the scope or measuring it in linear feet, these sorts of things. Um, this is actually much more akin to the kind of materials that uh, museum curators work with and the level of sort of uh, complexity that comes from working with these sorts of works embedded in things. And don't get me wrong, people find all kinds of interesting things in archival collections. It's just that with the possibility of finding a disk in there that could have literally anything on it in almost any format, um, the complexity just continues to increase. And in this case, it's worth noting that this is only uh, this is the analog tip of what's increasingly a, a digital iceberg in that uh, email, email is now the basis of correspondence. And just think about all the kinds of things that you have in your email, right? Your receipts are there, um, uh, all kinds of uh, official communications, unofficial communications, personal, public, um, all mixed together. And so there's, a, there's some really great work going on that I'll point everyone to. The Mellon Foundation is, is supporting this um, Digital Preservation Coalition um, Task Force on Email Archives. My colleague, uh, Kate Murray at the Library of Congress is doing a lot of work related to this, but it's a huge area for the future of um, archives, manuscripts, special collections material um, going forward. And what's fascinating with this is everything that I had just said about the sort of Lorenz situation is all the more so true for email, where literally anything and everything could be included inside email messages, and it may or may not be significant. Um, but it's, uh, it's of growing concern. So that's my, my simulation example. And uh, to close out the Lorenz simulation example, I'll just underscore that in that case, uh, unlike the Sagan floppies, we found ourselves in a situation where there was complex digital objects um, hidden inside a mail message that may or may not be significant, but in this case um, seemed quite significant, and that the long-term usability of the uh, something like a, a simulation involves a lot of, of thinking about how to keep computing environments functional, about virtual machines, about emulation. Um, we can't think about how to reformat a simulation in many ways. We need to think about how to enable infrastructure that can play those sorts of things. And that's going to be more and more a part of our, our work going forward. It's also interesting that with a simulation being preserved in that sense, there's the opportunity to go back and rerun and check assumptions in ways that... Um, are not so straightforward with, uh, with other kinds of objects that we've been passed down. So my next one is, um, uh, I'm, I'm, you, you may notice I'm mostly talking about other people's work. That's kind of part of what I end up doing. So I try and give a lot of credit to people who are really doing a lot of work leading in this space. And in this case, it's um, uh, Christy who's done a bunch of the work here. So it was great to have her um, introducing me. And so, um, the Health and Medicine Blogs collection here at the National Library of Medicine is a really fascinating exemplar of another huge change that's been happening. Uh, I, I talked early on about the difference between uh, published and unpublished and how that's been sort of a core um, pivot for thinking about library collections. But increasingly, uh, material like this, these uh, personal reflections, uh, blogs and the such, uh, are in this strange space where they are made public, but if you think about the various components of what something being published tends to mean, uh, they don't really meet all of the criteria. So they're publicly available. Generally, when someone publishes a blog post, they actually hit a button that says publish. So in that case, it seems like publish is happening, but at the same time, it doesn't carry the imprimatur or the sort of notion of peer review that comes with publication in most other areas in the um, science communication. And along with that, there's an implicit notion that 
blogging in particular is somehow more personal and that it's reflective, um, that it's something between a journal or a diary and a serial publication. The original terms for blogging comes from weblog, which was this idea that you would just log things that you were doing on the web, and that's very much a part of the tradition. So in that vein, um, the National Library of Medicine uh, has been a, one of the sort of pioneers of working in this space, particularly in the history of science and medicine, uh, early on starting with this health and medicines blog collection. And I'll point in particular to one of the examples, uh, which was featured in the report that came out of the convening that um, was mentioned in, in the introduction uh, for how these, these, this blog collection captures some really interesting perspectives that it's hard to even think about where you might find these sorts of things. So this is Life as a Healthcare CEO, which is a weblog from uh, uh, a healthcare CEO working in Boston. And in this case, here's a, a screenshot of uh, a blog post on modifications to HIPAA in 2013, where there's just sort of a running reflection on um, issues and themes that are coming from this. And if you think about the future of what uh, historical research on things like public policy related to health and on different perspectives that are relevant, so in this case, um, perspectives from the, the field, from organizations working in healthcare, these kinds of resources are going to be invaluable. Um, and it's hard to even imagine their sort of historical corollary. But with Web archives, one of the things that's really fascinating is that they're not only sort of serial publications, they're also always infinitely changeable. So the way that web archiving tools have been developed, um, when this site gets recrawled, the whole thing gets recaptured. So there's basically a temporal component to all of the individual um, pages that make up the publication as well. And so in this case, you end up with these very complicated structured objects that have their own different interfaces for search and discovery. So if you do want to look at this, um, the many of the organizations that do web archiving use Archivit, um, like the National Library of Medicine, to do web archive collecting. And you can go in here and look through and see the, the web archives organized according to the way they were originally structured online, which is, again, very much in keeping with the archives approach to giving the original order or the original structure and um, uh, interfaces together for accessing materials. And uh, it's you can see most of the little banner at the top, too, where you can actually see the specific date that this capture occurred, which is really important for the future of sort of citation and working with these kinds of materials. So this is a good example of, of uh, one work in this case. I'll share another one. This is, uh, you can see from the URL up at the top that this one is from webarchive.loc.gov. And in this case, uh, this is from research.iheartanthony.com. Um, and Anthony Solvago is a uh, scientist who, in this case, was working on his dissertation research in, um, uh, in, uh, with, with this set of specimens, plants growing here. And he was, in, he was participating in a practice that has emerged among scientists called open notebook science, which I think further helps confound some of these categorization things for us in that there's a whole... Uh, world of scientists who are now increasingly working in this open notebook practice where you literally publish your bench notebook every day to your blog and have your uh, images and things like that available immediately, which has similarly been playing out in changing the, the practices of science for constantly making data available in practice, but that this kind of notebook work is, is the sort of thing that you would find preserved in manuscript collections uh, at the end of someone's career. But in this case, for this science blogs collection that the Library of Congress started, we're getting the work as it's published on the front end as also part of documenting these changing practices in the work of science. Um, but it's, it's challenging in other ways, too, in that this requires a proactive engagement to collect these kinds of notebooks of scientists. So it ends up being in this really interesting mix between the different uh, traditions for published and unpublished works and for uh, sort of complex structural things that you might find in archival arrangement and order and the, uh, the sort of going out and getting things or procuring things that tends to be a part of uh, more library practices. So the next example I've got is my database of interstellar or extragalactic distances. Extragalactic, not interstellar. I should be very precise about this. Um, both sound grandiose to me, so one's just more so than the other. Um, uh, 
So this example is, uh, is one that I think is really intriguing and it is, is an example of how librarians and archivists are starting to be engaged with the ongoing maintenance of some of these complicated objects as they function. So uh, if you're interested, I did an interview with um, Carl and Robin from uh, the University of Maryland who are the people who've worked on this specific project uh, about their work and the, what follows is largely me talking about the work that they've done. And so here's a screenshot of the Extra Galactic Distance Database. Um, which you can find online. And like many scientific websites, it's not necessarily the most aesthetic, aesthetically compelling thing, but it does exactly what it needs to and nothing, uh, nothing more or less. The database is, a, is like many scientific works at this point, sort of a complicated mixture of uh, an online data backend um, with images and a variety of other um, textual material. In 2014, it was about 500 gigabytes of data, uh, a lot of it in FITS, which is an astronomical format for working with images. Um, but what's important about it is this. So I don't know if, if folks may or may not be familiar, but the extra galactic distance ladder is something I'm only vaguely qualified to talk about. I'm not an astrophysicist, but the, the general idea from this is that it, it illustrates how the, there's a, the latter functions in that there's a set of assumptions and uh, measures that come together based on different data sources to identify how far away particular objects are from the Earth. And then the latter is built by stacking those assumptions and measurements on top of each other so that you can ultimately find out uh, how far away something is based on tracing back through these different kinds of data. And what's really important with that is that the that means that our claims and our knowledge about distance is always tied to different sources of data and the assumptions that are associated with them. And so the, the database in this case is how those, that information are synthesized and maintained. What's challenging about this is that the database itself is increasingly being cited as a source in scholarship. And so it's being cited as if it was a publication, but it's a dynamic moving set of material. And it presents these complicated challenges to think through in terms of which, when someone cites it, they're really citing a moment in time based on a set of data that's available through the application. Uh, so Carl and Robin worked with the the scientists at the University of Hawaii and at the University of Maryland who work on this and established some practices for backing up and syncing material so that it would stay um, consistent and functional, but at the same time helping to think through how to maintain state information about it into the, into the past so that, uh, as noted, when we're referencing these kinds of live sources of material, there's, there's this complicated hierarchical relationship about what data was in there over time that becomes, that's still relevant. Um, and so here's another, this is some of what the tables look like inside of it, and it becomes this challenge of thinking through when it makes sense to just get all the data out, but at the same time the realization that the, um, the code that runs this system and the, uh, the, the calculations that run inside the system are just as significant as the data itself, and so it becomes this uh, challenge in thinking through which of those are the most sustainable and working with the scientists in this case to articulate what they need and what's also going to be important for a record of that work. And so they've been working on this for, for years and they have great captures of it going back and they're available. They sort of support the ongoing work of the science while also participating in um, archiving and, and preserving it. And so my next example is Grateful Med, um, which hopefully there are some fans of here. It's a, it's a great uh, a great historical work and has an important part of uh, a legacy here. Um, but it's also, I think, a really exciting example in that it's one of the um, leading examples we now have for how to work through the complex issues related to preserving software. So in, uh, mostly in this case, going to be talking about Nicole Contoxis' work, who was a NDSR resident here, who worked on who was brought in to try and figure out what to do to try and document or preserve this complex database application. Uh, her final report does a much better job than I'll do in a few minutes sort of summarizing and talking through the work that she did on this. But I think it's very helpful in illustrating um, 
up front, the title of my talk had the, the notion of preservation intent in it. And this is where I'll start to weave that into context. The idea with preservation intent is that increasingly we need to be very intentional and specific about what matters about something to be carried forward because we've got these different preservation traditions that we can draw from to do work and there are different ways that we could capture aspects of, of those material. And she did a great job illustrating this point through her work. So what's challenging about something like Grateful Med is that I can talk about it like it's a thing and you can say, oh yes, that, that sounds like a thing. There's a specific Grateful Med that exists. Um, but in practice, it's actually a piece of software that changed significantly over an extended period of time that involved calls to different databases or different data sources on the back end and that um, uh, sort of in that vein was consistently shifting and changing. It's hard to figure out what about it is fixed and things being fixed is one of those important challenging things that we need for preservation. It's hard to preserve things that or I guess it's, not, it's sort of out of scope to preserve things that don't exist in some fixed form. And so here we've got a, a picture of folks working with um, the software back in 1985. And when you start thinking across all the different versions of it, as Nicole did in her research and reported on in her report, um, if you pull any one of those versions up and started to boot it up, it needs to make calls out to sources for data um, which, again, now you're thinking about trying to preserve something. Not only do you have different versions, but you have different back-end software that that needs to interact with. It starts to become incre incredibly complicated. Um, but then there's also things like this, which are um, sort of uh, actual printouts. So much of this context of this work is actually preserved in a variety of different files and, and formats and records. So in some ways, some of this exists and is being preserved already, and she did a nice job of documenting much of what that work was. Uh, but this prompted a chance to come back and reflect on what the intention specifically was of working with uh, this initiative to do sort of the documentation existed, there were other forms of records, but what did they want to get at? And she ended up identifying uh, this piece of software, How To Grateful Med, um, which has a, a fantastic uh, graphical representation of the, of the institution here. Um, and what she ended up coming up with and, and working through was that this How To Guide, the tutorial in this, uh, had test data in it and also demonstrated and explored how to actually work with the software. So what was great about this was it was actually a guide for how to use the material and it had some aspects of it that were incorporated in it. So for the purposes of sort of a record of the work, um, this ended up being a much more both preservable thing because it was a self-contained piece of software that you can load and run in an emulator um, and that it had all this extra contextual information in it. Um, and so here it is, you can go online and uh, download it. Um, the, you can see the graphics even better right there. Um, uh, made records for it, and uh, you can download and run it, uh, which is great. The interesting thing, and I think an interesting reflection on this, is that in this case, the best way to preserve um, some to preserve Grateful Med was not to try and preserve the work at all, but instead to identify this secondary piece of material that was created for helping people interact with the software. And so when you step back and look at the constellations of records and sources that relate to it, this discrete work was something that you could pull out and um, keep and that would be illustrative for future users about it. But it does contextualize how much sort of research can go into these things and how when you use that preservation intent lens, um, you can come to very different results than if you just started from the assumption that you should get every piece of or version of this piece of software. Um, so I do encourage folks to check out the full version of the report, um, but that leaves me with my five examples covered and a chance to return to some of my initial points. So throughout these, we've seen some of the challenges that come between published and unpublished as sort of contexts that are collapsing, between textual and artifactual, when we think about the textual records in a manuscript collection, increasingly those include complex digital works like the software simulation, and also the extent to which formats are blurring and blending that uh, the manuscript collection has within it any number of other formats and will increasingly do so more and more as we have email in those collections. 
but that any of the ways that we attempted to make tidy distinctions are, are sort of uh, increasingly needed to be revisited and that we find ourselves needing to leverage all of the traditions that we have for uh, long-term access information uh, to information to, to get ahead. And with that, uh, returning to uh, three of the points that it sort of had pointed to in my uh, opening, that we're looking increasingly at thinking about preservation intent, which means thinking, uh, articulating what it is that matters about some set of works and coming up with approaches to working with them. This, is, this has resulted in, uh, I think a particularly relevant part of this is that oral histories have increasingly become a tool that we can use to document and study um, uh, aspects of work that wouldn't be there. So there's even opportunities where we might create things instead of simply just taking whatever we might find and preserving it. Um, and that in that context, I see preservation intent and source criticism as being things that need to be increasingly related. Source criticism is a concept uh, for historical research, which is, has been uh, not so much a huge part of the tradition here, but is a, a huge part of uh, historical research methods in other countries. And in this case, source criticism is the idea of what are the inherent features and, and components of digital materials or materials, any materials, but a digital source criticism focusing on digital materials, uh, looking at the, the features and affordances of those uh, files or mediums and, and reflecting on how to best interpret them and work with them. And it's worth underscoring in this case that a lot of the work that manuscript uh, and archives folks have been doing with digital forensics now, which is part of the examples I was sharing about the floppy disks, that is very heavily informed by the work of um, uh, uh, an English professor, Matt Kirschenbaum, who, had, who in innovated a lot of the techniques for working with forensic disk imaging and things like this for, um, for literary research, has, has ended up being essential for, for a sort of feedback loop for figuring about how we're going to serve, best serve users is, is largely focused on us also building relationships and getting uh, the scholarly community to start working with these kinds of primary sources. And that, I think, points to this huge need for collaborations between scholars and cultural heritage workers uh, with the idea that uh, there's that whole breadth of traditions from archives, libraries, and museums that all have interesting and, and compelling aspects to bring together for these collaborations around identifying what matters about works to be carried forward and then working through what can be interpreted in them. And in that vein, I'm happy to point to a lot of other um, examples of where scholars are trying to work on uh, what matters about digital objects and how those those points can be brought together with us. In this case, I've got the book covers of a bunch of different uh, relevant books. Um, Matt Kirschenbaum's book is Mechanisms, New Media and the Forensic Imagination. Um, Jonathan Stern is a, a sound studies um, author who just done some fantastic work on the history of MP3 as a format and some of its properties as a um, as digital material. Uh, Burdens of Proof is, is a, a fantastic book on the history of cryptography and the role that the development of different cryptographic traditions have played in digital objects. A uh, book up in the middle from Anastasia Sattler is on Flash and is a sort of history of that platform as it developed, which it's a, an important note that there's a whole body of scholarly research that's now referred to as platform studies, which is a attempting to approach how any creator working in some medium or platform takes certain assumptions and the affordances that the medium provides to be able to do their work. And so really understanding the nuances of how those platforms have changed over time becomes essential for understanding what their contributions are. Uh, Paper Knowledge is one more book that I'll mention in this, this mix, um, which is uh, a media history of documents and does this amazing job of picking apart how PDFs um, participate in the history of different kinds of document formatting and how the formats themselves have their own sort of significant historical properties. And then down at the bottom, um, it's not coming through totally on the picture, but Algorithms of Oppression is a, a fantastic recent book that looks at um, a variety of examples about how the algorithmic decision-making process around uh, software systems like Google Search uh, privilege and prioritize particular ways of seeing the world, um, particularly through um, sort of uh, race, class, and gender. Uh, 
Uh, so that's a tour of some of these different books. That's just to say that there's a lot of work happening in new media studies, in platform studies, in information studies that's very much relevant to us in terms of better understanding the nature of digital material and also uh, illustrates the kind of relationship that we can and should have with scholars. And so here's a running list of the, uh, the actual references for those which will be more relevant um, for you later when you can look at the slides online. Um, and I'll send them along so they can be distributed as a, a PDF to everyone too. Um, but so that's the run of my talk. And I'll just dive a little further back to say that the, the core concept here is that we increasingly need to be thinking about how to work across these different traditions. Um, and that I think an interesting aspect of this is that the archival work of long-term access to collections is coming more and more into play as part of the contemporary work and that we're uh, looking, looking increasingly at a world where we're working collaboratively both with scholars and with um, folks working across all these different traditions. So I am now happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Owens. This is really fascinating and really pertinent to a lot of the work that we're doing here at NLM, of course, and, uh, and a lot of the work that we have ahead of us in the future. Um, one question that I have that really you kind of prompted with your, your comment uh, just a couple of slides ago, but that there's a whole new field of uh, platform history mm. and new platforms uh, both for storage and for social media and for sharing information are, are emerging, you know, seems like by the hour. And it, it seems impossible to, to retain emulations of mm. all of it. So what's, is there a best practice that you've seen emerging as far as, uh, for example, Carl Sagan's Word Perfect files? Yeah. Is, the, is the best practice to maintain an emulator for WordPerfect that will enable us to use that, to, to access that content in the future, or is the best practice to continually migrate that, that content to whatever the new platform is? Yeah, so this, is, uh, this has been one of the essential questions of digital preservation for a, a while now, and at the, I think what's, what's interesting is in the last, I would say, um, five to ten years, we've seen a pretty big shift away from we had thought the answer to that question was largely going to be we need to keep forward migrating files to new formats. Um, but a variety of advances have been made in virtualization and emulation that are making it much more realistic to think about maintaining source files in their original formats, especially because it's so hard for us to articulate what about a file is or isn't significant um, to a future user. So what's happened is that we, the good news is, is that if you have some of these base images to work from, the sort of core operating system components, then the software runs inside that environment already. And so it ends up being a slightly less challenging problem for a lot of commercial software. And the other thing I would point to in this, in this space is that um, there's a platform that's called Emulation as a Service that um, the universe, or researchers at the University of Freiburg had been developing for years, an open source platform. Um, which now a variety of U.S. institutions have started running as well. So at this point, um, uh, Yale has taken on a bit, uh, Yale's library has taken on a big role in advancing this technology. Recently, got um, several million dollars in grant funding from Sloan and Mellon Foundations to advance that work. And I think we're getting closer and closer to um, having sort of resources that enable some of the base level work for maintaining um, virtual environments that then uh, we can load all kinds of software that we keep. And so in this case, it thankfully becomes more of a case of just doing bit preservation, making perfect copies and maintaining those and their integrity, and then loading those up in this set of uh, environments. Um, but that doesn't foreclose the possibility that um, this is all tied up in what the, what the state of computing tools and services is and will be. And so I, I think it is entirely possible that we may see moments where we need to do mass migrations of files into other formats in the future, but that those are thankfully going to be um, large-scale sort of um, 
operations to be done uh, computationally at some point. And those will, I think, interestingly involve the emulated virtualized environment. So if we end up getting into situations where we're concerned about those, we could then batch create derivatives um, or new versions of files. But I think that in, importantly, and this is part of, I think, the concept with, with source and source criticism here, and just the same way that when a historian comes and wants to read uh, 17th century manuscripts and we hand them to them, and the, if they say, I can't read this handwriting, we don't say, we say, you have to learn how to read the handwriting if you want to read this document. That I think is going to be, that sort of digital archaeology is already something that scholars are starting to work in, and many of these books illustrate the kinds of scholarly practices that are going to involve in that space, and we'll have the same kinds of collaborations with scholars around um, those born digital materials that people need to be able to um, pick up the skills to work with. Oh, hi. Yeah. A great talk. Thank, thank you very much for coming. I'm curious, did, have you or others done any thinking around the user experience for these, these kinds of materials? Because I can tell you as, as a digital analyst how I might track that for each of these files. But what's, what's the current thinking now on what, how to develop, improve, track, manage the digital experience for these kinds of new materials as you go forward? Yeah, happy to. I think um, that's very much uh, an evolving question. I think one of the things that's really, um, that is really exciting that we're still figuring out how to make best use of is that digital objects come with so much embedded technical and descriptive metadata that the ability to have all kinds of metadata about objects at the file level um, means that there's a lot of new potential for discovery. Um, by, set, by listing out every single resource that exists, how big the file size is, all these kinds of things that are, what formats they're in. A lot of that stuff sort of comes for free, but we do need to build out the ways of, of surfacing that information and working with it. Um, in terms of user experience, it's very much uh, an open question too. Uh, there are a few different groups that have been doing some experiments trying out sort of a virtualized environment and also just the file list of everything that was in. Another fun example that, that's good to bring up is Salman Rushdie donated his collection to Emory University and it came with three or four laptops. Um, uh, there was actual Mac laptops that he had worked in and um, they did some of the earliest work on exploring emulated environments and what's really amazing is that um, he was a huge user of sticky notes in the Mac laptop and you have to push that button and you see the sticky notes and they're all different colors and that meant something and they're organized in a way and that means something but at the same time they have that emulated environment that you can work in and they have um, just the file lists that are searchable and indexable in different ways. And what I think we're likely gonna be seeing uh, in, in the future is the, the need and want for scholars to be able to pivot back and forth between those two things so that you look at what it looked like in some original environment and you might explore that because there may be context that's relevant there, but then you also flip back and look at it in the file tree and you just do full text search um, and that those kinds of context shifting will be important. It's worth noting in this case too that one of the themes that comes through in uh, a lot of this emerging scholarship on working with digital material is that um, a lot of the earliest sort of speculations about digital content with, co uh, with from literary work, uh, from literary scholars and things like this, uh, focused a lot on what things looked like on the screen but that it's increasingly clear that that was, that's not being sort of diagnosed as screen essentialism with this idea that um, there's so much about that's recorded inside computing environments that doesn't render on the screen that's still potentially significant, embedded metadata or track, you know, hidden information in files and all that sort of forensic information is going to be a huge resource going forward. And it's, it, it's worth noting that in that case it's, also comes back to questions of preservation intent and that we need to be very reflective about really making sure that we're, we, in some cases we wanna make sure that we capture and persist that information. In other cases, we need to make sure that we're doing right by the donors or, or users of that who may not know that all that hidden information is there and that we're thinking through what we are or aren't persisting forward on that. Uh, but I would say that the user experience questions are very much um, uh, open-ended questions that are in need of a lot of basic research at this point too. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. 
Um, so for teams at, here at NLM and um, elsewhere that work with, uh, we work with to uh, collect and disseminate current materials to users, current digital materials, um, what can we do to better like think archivally and to work with the folks who are doing more digital preservation uh, to help preserve and make those uh, materials last better and to be um, more archival? Sure, great question, um, and great to see you again. Um, uh, what I'd say is that the, um, there's, there's some good work that's gone on around the sustainability of different digital formats, and so that I think is a very relevant thing for everyone working in different aspects of libraries, archives, and museums, even if you're on the production end of thing, things. Uh, the Library of Congress maintains a website, um, which uh, I'd, I'd mentioned Kate Murray earlier, and she's one of the, the core people uh, that, that makes that happen, that has information about different file formats and the, the sustainability factors that are associated with them. So there are, um, there are a lot of things that folks can be doing at different points in any information life cycle for thinking about how the data that's produced or that results from things might be more sustainable or maintainable. And that's, I think, something where um, there are also a lot of opportunities to, uh, to think about reaching out and asking someone um, for their perspective on, on this work earlier on in the life cycle. So if there is um, uh, being in contact with folks that deal with both electronic records and with preservation of uh, materials for the long term, early on in the life cycle of developing platforms and things like that to think about how the assets that are produced from those can ultimately make their way into sort of out of active use and into archival contexts. Mm -hmm. So those will be a couple Thoughts? Yep. I'd like to, to pivot back to, you, you kind of touched on something that I was wondering about uh, two questions ago, I guess, but um, about the ethics of mm -hmm. some of the, uh, the digital preservation. When you were talking about Jonathan Larson and the hidden or the unknown you know, lyrics that uh, were uncovered serendipitously. Has any, is anybody exploring the ethics of whether or not, you know, in this case, Jonathan Larson ever meant for those yeah. to be uncovered? You know, in, in, the, in the days of paper manuscripts, if you scribbled something down and didn't like it and didn't want anybody to see it, you threw it away and it was done. But you might think you threw a digital file away yeah. But then somebody stumbles onto it, and so how 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 are we exploring that idea? No, it's a great. Uh, there's there are a lot of challenges around this, and I think some things. There are some organizations, for instance, that um, are have made decisions to only do logical um, captures of of data as opposed to forensic ones, and that will that actually wouldn't have addressed that particular instance, but it would catch a lot of other things around hidden files. Um, so there are ways to think about doing that. There are also ways that folks are approaching. Um, uh, the, it opens up questions for archival processing in that um, in many cases, uh, the organizations, are, when, when people are processing manuscript collections, they've got identified areas for things they might redact or remove. Um, and those get tied up into donor agreements too. Another area where this has been developing is, is putting explicit language into donor agreements related to these things to make donors aware of what they are or aren't um, opening up to. But at the same time, there's, uh, there's another aspect of this, which is that there's always been collateral information that comes in in a manuscript collection. And so in that vein, um, I mean, a good example of this is that all of the correspondence from all the people that wrote to Lorenz or Sagan, they didn't necessarily intend that to become part of a archival collection. Um, but it, and so that sort of collateral component is very much part of the ongoing deliberations around these things. Um, but I think this does open up a whole other vector, which is that it's now, if you could take all of these files and put them on the internet for anyone ever to have access to, like we're into access. Um, but at the same time, we're also very much interested and focused on social responsibility. And so the fact that um, and I say we in this case, just not in terms of any particular organization, but just librarians, archivists, um, curators. Uh, we're also very much interested in 
we've had these very mediated experiences that have been the basis of how we've worked with things. So people come into a reading room, they sit down, they're working with a the collection, there's some amount of um, context that comes from that and the ability for these materials to be openly accessible everywhere is really exciting but at the same time challenging for thinking through what that does mean um, for uh, collateral material. And so I think that, I don't, I don't necessarily think there are any easy answers but the other aspect that I just underscore with it too is that with different sorts of creators we have different feelings about whether or not their intentions matter for <laughs> the record too. Um, so I think another context with this is 500 years from now, what are our feelings about what the creator of those records wanted uh, or about trying to get the most authentic rendering of some historical incident um, through source material. So um, some organizations are playing around with ways of, um, uh, I mean a lot of collections have, have long had embargo periods for certain sorts of material and so that's one way that you can deal with some of this or um, different sorts of right restrictions on different sorts of content. Um, and it's, it's, there's a little bit there that is brand new that's because of digital information and there's a lot of it that's exactly the same as the same issues we've worked through for uh, hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, great, great talk, Trevor. Uh, big picture question. How do you see this space that you've described so well through these examples intersecting with the space that we're all facing now, particularly here at the National Library of Medicine, called data science. Mm. The expanding universe of data as we all certainly understand it. How, how do you see these spaces interacting now and yeah. say five years from now? So uh, the first, uh, the at the Library of Congress, we've had a series of events that have focused on this idea of collections as data, which is increasingly the way that um, different kinds of scholars and users want to approach collection material in general. And I think that's just going to grow more and more. Um, and in that vein, I think particularly with, with what's, what's exciting about a lot of this born digital content is that it's, it, it's already computable. We don't need to turn it into data um, to make it uh, resources that people can compute against. And within that, the, the kinds of data that emerges from these sources is, uh, is going to be material that people want to um, use to study any, in any number of computational science approaches. So in that sense, I would say that data science is increasingly a part of uh, just about every academic discipline's approach to studying information or sources. Uh, along with that, I think one of the most interesting interventions that's come from humanities scholars working with data more and more is that um, there is some naivete that comes from a, a, just approaching. A, a great example is uh, there's, a, there's a new book out that's called Bit by Bit that is, um, uh, I'm forgetting his name, but he's a social scientist at Princeton or Yale. Um, and a lot of what he talks about in the book is the tensions that emerge between data scientists coming in and saying, oh, we, we, we have big data, we can solve the problems. And then the social scientists who've been struggling with the complicated challenges of interpreting what social data mean um, and the sort of tug and pull that's come between those two communities. Because in many cases, context is so important to picking apart what you can do with old data. Um, in particular, or if you have social media data or transactional data, a lot of these, these sorts of data that people want to work with in data science are much more like bureaucratic archival records that have a very particular point of view and that you need to check all kinds of assumptions with. And in that case, I would say that um, there's a huge opportunity there for um, interchange between different sorts of scholars on how to interpret material and that increasingly um, all of these different sources that we're working with are things people are going to want to approach as data. I think one of my favorite examples in that case is there's a crowdsourcing project that's called Old Weather. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with this or not, but Old Weather has um, digitized this mass amount of ships manifests that people have been transcribing. And what's, what's climate scientists are super interested in um, old records of weather that go back hundreds of years. And it turns out that ships have been the best instruments for collecting that data for a long time. We have to get those manuscript ship logs and get the data out of them so that they can be acted upon in that way. And so I think in that vein, there's all kinds of historical collections that are uh, great resources. Another good one is the 
New York Public Library had this project to transcribe historical menus, and those menus are full of fascinating information about fish populations based on the dishes that show up over time and the costs of those dishes that are associated with different kinds of fish. Um, so in that case, um, I think part of data science's contribution is, is sort of seeing everything in the world as potentially being data. And then the, the, so in that case, archives are full of data, but archives are also full of archivists who really understand what that data means and how it was produced, and that's a, a huge thing that data science needs from archivists. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. How do we, as producers of this data, anticipate the needs of data scientists going forward? How can we produce products that will facilitate their uh, research ends? That's, uh, so I think in that vein, some of the points about sustainability of formats are, are relevant and useful there, Th trying to think about all kinds of ways to make the data um, uh, useful and reusable is, is helpful, but there's also um, documentation is huge for this, and I think one of the biggest things that comes through, uh, when I was at the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we had funded several different projects around data management plans, and um, I'm sure this is a case, uh, right, how much research does, uh, does this institution fund? In the big sense, massive amounts, right? And what is the quality of the underlying data that comes from that? It's gonna vary. Um, I think one of the things we had ended up with in that case was uh, a massive amount of smaller researchers are working in spreadsheets and just trying to get them to start using code books where you can then, someone can use that for reproducibility is huge. Um, so I think that there's a lot of spaces where um, core questions for the future usability of data are about um, data dictionaries um, and structure and organization. Um, and this is one of these situations where I think one of the challenges that we face is that um, librarianship and archives practices are uh, at this point, you know, hundreds of years of thinking through how to best organize and make information available. And there's a massive amount of knowledge that still needs to be put in dialogue with um, the world that computer science has, has brought to us for uh, making sure that the, the generations of knowledge we have are, are embedded in those practices. Uh, Trevor, I want to thank you very, very much yeah. uh, on behalf of the History of Medicine Division of the National Library of Medicine for this fantastic talk, and thanks to everyone here at the Lister Hill Auditorium and everyone watching online. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. This is so much fun.